Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Support grows for Palestinian prisoner on 56th day of hunger strike. The Free Syrian Army claims responsibility for blasts in Aleppo. And Egypt's military deploys troops ahead of general strike. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. We start with the case of Palestinian prisoners. Attorney Jawad Bulus said the judge of the Occupation's Court of Appeals suspended a session held under exceptional conditions at Ziv Hospital in Safed to review the appeal submitted by the Palestinian Prisoner Society to the Ofer Court. The court ordered prisoner Khader Adnan be held in administrative detention for four months. Bulus added that after deliberations and listening to the prisoner Khader's testimony, the judge decided to postpone the session to review documents the occupation intends to submit. He confirmed he will issue a decision on the appeal after these procedures are completed. In front of Ofer prison, west of Ramallah, a sit-in was organized in solidarity with prisoner Khader Adnan, who continues his empty stomach battle. His name is Khadr Adnan. He is from the Araba village near the Jenin district. He has not been charged with anything, but is currently held under indefinite administrative detention. He is married and has two daughters. This is the man of legendary resistance and confrontation. He added exceptional and substantial momentum to the prisoners' movement. His action is unprecedented in the history of the occupation's prisons. He is on an open-ended hunger strike that will be ended by his release or martyrdom. This heroic move pushed masses to rally in solidarity with prisoner Khadr, and the mobilization is growing every day. All the country's provinces are participating. Sirens are taking place in front of the Red Cross, tents were pitched at the martyr Yasser Arafat's roundabout in central Ramallah, and sirens were also held in front of the Ofer prison. They are trying to kill this voice coming out of the occupation's prison cells, while we are trying to echo that voice and draw the world's attention to the fact that, in 2012, there is still a backward, racist and fascist country that continues to practice this backward kind of detention. As for the father of prisoner Khadr Adnan, he has also started a hunger strike. He sent a message to the whole world that it's imperative to intervene to save his son's life, especially since his life is now in danger after 55 days of strike. My son Hada has ulcers on his two lips and tongue. He is now confined to the hospital and no aid is provided to him. It is now time for this knight to dismount from his horse. He has struggled for 55 days, rebuking the occupation in its own backyard and inside the hospital. It is now time for this knight to rest. It seems the legend of Khadr Adnan's hunger strike continues indefinitely. But as Adnan planned, it will only end with victory when he can breathe the air of freedom and the demands of all prisoners in the occupation's prison cells are met. Fifty-five days and Khadr Adnan is still steadfast in his legendary battle. He is challenging his executioners, only armed with his willpower. As for the world, it is listening and watching, but does not speak up. Sarah Al Adra, Palestine TV, Ramallah. أسعد الله أوقاتكم وأهلا بكم. The Free Syrian Army claimed responsibility for two attacks targeting a military intelligence compound and a riot police base in Aleppo. In an interview with BBC, Deputy Commander of the Free Syrian Army, Colonel Maliki al-Kurdi, said FSA members attacked the two buildings with machine guns and rockets. However, he accused the Syrian regime of causing the explosion in the military intelligence building to block the FSA's operation. 
He added that the Free Syrian Army did not have any bomb-laden vehicles. Syria's state-run TV says the two bombings targeted a military security branch and the base of a riot police brigade in the northern Syrian city of Aleppo. 25 people were killed and 175 were injured. A cloud of smoke is rising from the city of Aleppo. According to those who uploaded these images online, it is the result of the blast that targeted the military security building and the base of a riot police brigade. It is considered the first operation of its kind by the Free Syrian Army, the most prominent faction within the armed Syrian opposition. The FSA mostly consists of defectors from the Syrian Army. However, the FSA only claimed responsibility for the armed attack and not for the bombing caused by a booby-trapped vehicle. The Syrian government was quick to condemn the two attacks. The Syrian Ministry of Health said the death toll reached 28, including military members and civilians. In addition, 235 were wounded, according to the Syrian state news agency SANA. Since its establishment, the Free Syrian Army has insisted on affirming that its operations only aim to protect civilians. In a prior statement, its leadership denied it intends to transition to offensive operations. The attack occurred on Friday in the daytime as Syrians were protesting in Aleppo. The city has recently begun to witness anti-regime demonstrations. These protests were renewed on Friday and confronted by gunfire from the security forces according to dissonance who uploaded these images online. قالت الهيئة العامة للثورة السورية أن حصيلة القتلى ارتفعت اليوم إلى 65 سقطوا برصاص The Syrian Revolution's General Commission said the death toll rose to 65 people today, most of whom were killed by the gunfire of security forces in the army in Homs, where the Syrian army is continuing its military operations. Meanwhile, thousands of Syrians protested in various parts of the country in what was called the Friday of Russia is killing our children. Through this slogan, the Syrian opposition expressed its rejection of Russia's position on the Syrian crisis at the Security Council. Some areas witnessed confrontations between protesters and the Syrian military and security forces, whose tanks heavily struck neighborhoods of Syrian towns and villages. The daily scene of shelling continues in Homs. These images show the situation in Bab Amr. But the people of Homs, enduring military attacks as well as violent artillery shelling, took to the streets. In the neighborhood of Al-Qusur, dissidents named this Friday, Russia is killing our children, and also the Friday to bear arms. The Syrian Revolutionary Commission's call to take up arms coincides with the growing calls on the Syrian street to embrace the Free Syrian Army's forces. Among the remaining areas witnessing the popular mobilization was Homs, which chanted for victory. Syria's flag of independence was raised alongside the Kurdish flag in the El Hasaka region of Al Qamishli. Cities and villages in Idlib province saw protests as well. <laughs> this is the neighborhood of Al Hamadiyya in Hama, and protests also erupted in the Al Fardus neighborhood of Aleppo, despite the explosions that struck the security centers. <laughs>
These demonstrations come on the eve of a general strike and civil disobedience campaign on Saturday. It is called for by youth groups and political blocs. Major parties objected to the call, including the Muslim Brotherhood, and Noor Party, and Al Wafid Party. Also opposing the call was Al Azhar and the Egyptian Church, which considered it illegal and against religious law. <laughs> Who is motivating the current instability in Egypt? This is a question in need of an answer on the first anniversary of former President Hosni Mubarak's downfall. The slogan, Friday of Departure, is still raised, but this time it is directed at the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. Once again, their vehicles are moving to the streets, claiming to protect the people amid calls for demonstrations targeting the Defense Ministry one day before a strike and civil disobedience campaign begins in commemoration of Mubarak's downfall. The call for protests and civil disobedience was sent by what is described as the revolutionary parties that demand the departure of the military council, resignation of the incumbent government and formation of a national coalition government to restructure the police and other institutions in the country. Political parties are divided. The Freedom and Justice Party, Al-Nur, Al-Wasat, Al-Wafd, as well as Al-Azhar, Darad Ifta, the Coptic Church, and a number of communities rejected the call for civil disobedience. Meanwhile, some parties support the call, such as the Free Egyptians Party, the Socialist Popular Alliance Party, and the Egyptian Current Party. These parties do not hide their dissatisfaction with the results of the parliamentary elections. The Egyptian People's Assembly, controlled by a majority of Islamist movements, issued statements saying it does not refute the importance of restructuring the ministries of interior and information, achieving independence of the judiciary, and transferring power to civilians. The Muslim Brotherhood affirmed its political party is ready to form a national coalition government, saying its disputes with other parties are merely over the implementation mechanism. However, the two sides' different interpretations of the conflict at the interior ministry that follow the Port Said incidents and the security breakdown indicate that the situation is even more complicated than it seems. During the confrontations, accusations were directed at Islamists of selling out the revolution and being biased towards the military council. The focus of the events has begun to shift from the the surroundings of the interior ministry to the defense ministry. This is a reminder of the clashes that took place on July 23, 2011, when protesters marched to Al Abbasiyah targeting the defense minister. This happened as accusations were directed at the April 6 movement of receiving foreign funds and a controversy over whether to prioritize drafting the constitution or conducting the elections. The same accusations are present and the same controversy is ongoing today. The Houthis refuted a statement issued by the U.S. Ambassador to Sana'a, Gerald Firestein, who confirmed meeting with Houthi representatives and receiving assurances that they will participate in the early presidential elections. Firestein was interviewed Thursday night by the Yemeni state television. The Houthis announced they have reached a truce with armed fighters loyal to the Reform Party and Wahhabi groups in Haja province. Meanwhile, massive demonstrations broke out in Sada'a in rejection of presidential elections. نحن نتفهم أن هناك Appearing on Yemeni state television, the U.S. ambassador to Sana'a issued provocative statements in a bid to prevent Yemen's revolutionaries from achieving their objectives, which the U.S. and its Saudi ally are seeking to undermine by implementing the Riyadh agreement that grants immunity to President Saleh. The U.S. ambassador's remarks, which stirred public outrage, come as part of U.S. intervention in the country. Firestein said that Washington is exerting tremendous efforts to restructure the Yemeni army and reorganize its ranks, especially in light of recent waves of defections among its divisions. In an attempt to grant false legitimacy to the presidential elections, the U.S. ambassador said he met with Houthi representatives and received a positive response regarding the upcoming elections. It seems the ambassador is trying to embarrass the Houthis or distort their image by claiming they are in contact with Americans. In response, the Houthis quickly dismissed the U.S. ambassador's allegations. In a statement issued by the Houthis' media office, the group's leader, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, denied holding a meeting or reaching an agreement with the U.S. ambassador, adding that such behavior undermines the country's sovereignty and independence. Al-Houthi further said that such claims are part of political propaganda and a fabricated act of deception aimed at implementing the U.S. plan. The statement also stressed the importance of boycotting the elections, which it described as illegitimate and predetermined. 
determined. In response to the U.S. ambassador's claims about Iranian intervention in Yemeni affairs, the Houthis described it as strange and shocking. This is another message the Houthis sent to the U.S. ambassador in a bid to affirm their national position, as well as to reject foreign intervention in the country's affairs. Tens of thousands of Yemenis demonstrated in the country's northern province of Sada. The protesters rejected early elections in which Abdul Rabur Mansur Hadi, who is the sole candidate, is running for president. The Houthis remain an integral part of the country's political equation, and that is causing concern for the Saudi regime that is seeking to weaken them by distracting them with fighting the Reform Party and Wahhabi groups. However, the latest developments confirm that both sides have indeed reached a truce in the country's northern province of Hajjah following fierce battles. The deal calls on both sides to commit to a ceasefire, reopen all roads, refrain from using weapons or accuse others of apostasy, recognize one another, and work to end the stalemate in the region. The deal also calls on armed groups to return to their regions. The Houthis said earlier they have expelled all Saudi-backed armed groups and seized their Saudi-originated weapons from the area of Aham in the Hajja province. The crackdown on anti-regime protests continues in Saudi Arabia. Government forces have killed another demonstrator and injured two others in the city of Awamiya in eastern province. The killed protester has been identified as Zuhair Abdullah Al Said. The protesters have taken to the streets across the province, including in the city of Qatif, to condemn the killing of a demonstrator by regime forces in the city on Thursday. The Friday prayers leader in Awamiya demanded an end to the al-Assad rule. Government forces also injured 14 people during Thursday's protests in the province. The region has been the focal point of demonstrations against the Riyadh regime over the past year. Authorities have strictly banned any anti-government gatherings across the kingdom. International organizations such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have frequently condemned what they call Riyadh's gross violations of human rights. Also in the headlines today, tens of thousands have staged an anti-regime demonstration near Bahrain's capital city. The rally has been organized by the main opposition group al Wafaq. The demonstrators are demanding reforms and a peaceful transition of power. al Wafaq has held several massive rallies since the popular uprising began in the country in February 2011. Anti-government protests have escalated over the past months despite an intensifying Saudi-backed government crackdown. Schools have been killed, several hundred arrested so far. Thousands more have been sacked from their jobs for taking part in the anti-regime rallies. Dominic Kawakeb with the Bahrain Justice and Development Movement is joining us now on live rather from London to share his thoughts with us on this. Mr. Kawakeb, tens of thousands of people out again on the streets in a massive rally demanding the fall of King Hamad in Bahrain. The question is how long can the U.S., which has its fifth naval fleet based in Bahrain, turn a blind eye on these people's legitimate demands? Well, uh, hopefully not longer. I mean, again, today we've seen 10,000s, you know, thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of people out on the streets in Bahrain, just like we've seen time and time again over the past year. It's now a year since the 14th February uprisings began in Bahrain, and absolutely nothing has changed. There hasn't been any real progress. In fact, the people have just suffered more because of the brutal crackdown that, that, that they've been forced to endure as a result of, you know, expressing their, their, their right to protest and their right to rally. And yes, unfortunately, they are being ignored um, largely by the international community. 
the uh, United States human rights envoy Michael Posner has been in Bahrain um, over the last few days and, and he said yesterday that he urges talks and dialogue between the opposition and the government and, and that's true, we would love to see that, we'd love to see a real dialogue taking place but not the sort of dialogue that the Bahrain government seems to be doing so far where they, they talk amongst themselves, we need to see a real dialogue that engages the opposition, that discusses the key issues such as elected government, such as free and fair and open elections and all the, all the things that would make Bahrain the, the democratic society that the people want to see. In other news, Washington has been less than enthusiastic about the agreement reached this week between rival Palestinian factions Hamas and Fatah. The accord calls for PA President Mahmoud Abbas to head an interim government to supervise the run-up to elections later this year. According to State Department spokeswoman Victoria Newland, any Palestinian government that includes Hamas will never have legitimacy until the terror group accepts conditions set by the Middle East Peace Quartet. Waiting to see whether how this deal might be implemented, if in fact it is implemented at all. Uh, we've seen lots of deals come and go of this kind. What matters to us and what matters, we think, to the process that we are trying to keep on track here is that Abbas remains the president, that Fayyad remains the prime minister. Uh, so we're not going to speculate on what the effect might be. However, as we've said, um, again and again and again, uh, with regard to Hamas, any Hamas participants who come into the government, if they want to work with us, have to recognize the state of Israel, have to renounce violence, and have to agree to uphold any past uh, agreements of the PA. That, that standard does not change. Amid the reports that Hamas has agreed to allow Fatah to lead the interim Palestinian government, speculation is mounting that the extremist organization is growing weaker due to the uprisings throughout the Arab world. IBA's Ariel Resh have discussed implications of that development with terrorism expert Yoram Schweitzer. I think it's uh, part of uh, Hamas' decision to go along with some kind of uh, preparatory process towards the uh, elections in May. And I think they don't mind letting Abu Mazen uh, representing this uh, cooperation, this entity, until the election takes place, because he will uh, show the face, the pleasant face of the Palestinians. For Hamas, it's working very well. There are reports that Hamas is essentially homeless because of what's happening in Damascus. Hamas has tried to relocate its headquarters. What do you believe is next for the movement? First of all, they have a house and they have a home. It's in Gaza. Uh, and I think uh, they are looking for a, a new resident. And one of the options is Egypt. I think it's the favorable one. And I don't think that they believe they, they can be hosted by the Jordanians. I don't think they uh, hope it will happen. Maybe they will go for one of the Gulf countries for the meantime. Less than three weeks before the first round of parliamentary elections in Iran, the conservative camp entered the competition for seats at the Shura Council on at least five different lists. Candidates from the reformist camp will try to seize on this division and are counting on this fracture to make a strong comeback in the legislative branch, despite the various problems they face. Rida al-Basha reports from Tehran. The Iranian political scene resurfaces ahead of the parliamentary elections to reveal the depth of the division that has been entrenched since the last presidential elections. The split seems more clear in the conservative camp that enters the elections with more than five lists competing for control of the upcoming parliament. The reformists are trying to take advantage of the situation and they might be able to grab some seats. 
المصلحيين من المشاركة في الانتخابات Despite preventing many reformists from participating in the upcoming elections, there are over 500 candidates who share the ideas of the reformists, in addition to the reformists who were allowed to run. For this reason, we must take advantage of the current division in the conservative camp to get the largest number of candidates in the parliamentary elections. The attempt to make a comeback is viewed by some as difficult, especially in light of the clear and unequal war between reformists and conservatives. The latter camp has all the power and controls all the institutions. We wanted to actively participate in the upcoming elections, and we asked them to remove the obstacles and problems they created. They cancelled many of our organization's licenses and prevented our newspapers from functioning as usual. But they did not respond to our demand, which obstructs our path in the upcoming elections, especially since the requirements of participation are unequal and unfair. And while the nomination requirements are equal under the law, everyone is aware of the efforts to prevent reformist candidates from winning seats in the legislative body. In between attempts to exclude the reformist camp and the latter's efforts to stay, views on whether the upcoming elections will be able to draw a political map that represents the Iranian street vary. Less than two weeks before the Iranian parliamentary elections, concerns are growing over a repeat of the protest scene on one hand and a weak popular participation in the elections on the other. Lerida al Basha, Dubai TV, Tehran. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Wincoat Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.